Good morning. Good to see you, and great to be here with you again. It's been a while, so I'm really, uh, really glad to be back and just to be able to join in together. It's great to be able to come and fellowship with other Christian communities around our country. So thanks for the uh, thanks for the invite. You know, I've heard it said that a vision without a task makes a visionary, and a task without a vision is drudgery. But a vision with a task makes a missionary. You know, there's an interesting verse that I'm sure if you've been involved in church for any part of your life, you may have heard, and it says this in Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision or no revelation, is another, another translation there, the people perish or they rebel, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. What does that mean? Put simply this way, where the Word of God, where the Bible and where God's Word is not proclaimed to people and is not explained to people, then people are exposed to shame, they rebel, they kind of run away from what God is wanting to do in their life, they scatter, and they're idle. They don't really do much with their life for God where His Word is not proclaimed. Because you see, the thing is this, the Word of God... The Word of God brings us a vision that should capture our heart, remove any shame that we have, prevent us from rebelling, prevent us from running away from God, keeps us following our leader Jesus, makes us truly alive so that we don't just sit idle in our lives, but we live our lives for Him. When the Word of God is proclaimed, and it's proclaimed regularly, and it's proclaimed faithfully. It gives us that vision of Jesus. So I want to ask you a simple question today. What is capturing your vision? What is capturing your vision? The Apostle Paul was captured by this all-consuming vision of one thing, Jesus. One person, Jesus Christ. That was it for Paul. This is how he says it. Okay? If you've got a Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 3. Verses 7 to 11. This is what Paul says. He was an amazing man, Paul. And he says this, But whatever was to my profit, because he'd been talking about his background, his heritage, the, the fact that he grew up as a, as a Jewish young man and he knew so much about God's law and about God, but he'd never come to know Jesus until a point in his life where he meets Jesus and he writes this, whatever was to my prophet, all of this other stuff, I now consider it a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from following the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And look at what he says here. What is it? I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Can you see Paul's vision? Can you hear it? Can you envision it? Here is Paul actually stuck in chains in a jail when he's writing this. I don't know about you, but if I was him, I might have been thinking, my real vision is to be out of this jail, is to be free. But no, his vision, because he knew what true freedom was, his vision was to know Christ, to know Jesus. Man. You know, sometimes we can pray for God's power, we can pray for God to help us to get us out of situations, to give us strength, to give us wisdom. And, and you know, all of that is, is fine. It's good. But all of that has to be subservient to one prayer of our hearts. Jesus, may I know you. May I know you. Imagine if together we came together as Christians 
and we didn't so much as pray for revival as just prayed for Jesus, for us to know Jesus more. And out of that, our lives were revived. We've got to know Jesus more. We've got to be consumed with Him. You know, I love it that you guys are talking, as you have for many years, about what it means to reach into your community. And, and you've got the catch cry of, of organic outreach, and that's great. You know, what does it mean for, for everything to just, for outreach to just be what we are? That we are a people that reaches out into the community around us, the world around us. That's fantastic. But you know, if we are truly going to be a church community that reaches out, then we need to start with a vision that is up. A vision that is up. A vision that sees Jesus for who He really is and is consumed by that vision. The prophet Isaiah, he had this vision that was up. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. This amazing piece of Scripture, and we're going to just base what we talk about this morning in Isaiah chapter 6. Let me read to you from verses 1 to 5 to start with. Isaiah tells us when he had this vision. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him were seraphim, angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, these angels. They were calling out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, Isaiah cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Do you get the picture here? Here is this prophet of God, Isaiah. And there comes a point where this king, one of the many kings of, of you know, of all the kings of Israel and Judah, and one, and one after one, these kings, most of them, would be people who fell away from God's call on their life. They, they disappointed the nation. They walked away from God and they led the nation of Israel and the late nation of Judah often into sin. And here is Isaiah, and one more of these kings, King Uzziah, has failed again. He'd started pretty good, but after a while we read that he became powerful, and his pride led to his downfall. And so the king has died, and now Isaiah comes into the temple, comes to meet with God, and I don't know what was going through Isaiah's mind, but maybe it was this sense of, oh, not again. Not again. God, when are we going to have a righteous king who is going to live and walk and rule our nation with righteousness? But once more, one has failed. And maybe Isaiah was coming into the temple to say, God, help us. God, send us another king. God, make it a king who's going to live for you. God, give me strength. I'm a prophet, but I don't know what to do. Maybe all of these things were going around in his mind. But he comes into that temple, and with his heart and his mind perhaps clouded with all of this stuff, God just peels back the curtain of eternity. And suddenly, Isaiah is in the midst of this vision. And try and, I mean, it's very hard for us to grasp it, isn't it? But this vision is he, he's looking up and he sees, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, that he sees Jesus, the glory of Jesus. And Jesus is sitting there and he sees the throne and the train of the robe that he's wearing. The tip of the train is filling the temple. It's just this picture of glory and wonder and holiness. It's phenomenal. And here is Isaiah and he sees the angels encircling the throne. And every time they encircle, they say, Holy, holy, holy. They're calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy. And you know, if we are going to be people that as a community are going to reach out into the world, we need to have this, this, this vision of holiness. This vision of God's glory that would just consume us. You know, Isaiah 66 verse 1, God says, 
Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Do you realize that we are on God's footstool? Just the place like where His feet would rest. And there's that wonderful old song that used to say, Worship at His footstool. Here we are on earth, His footstool, and we can worship the God whose throne is in heaven. God is almighty. The Lord Almighty, Lord of all heaven and earth, commander of the angel armies. You know, He is no mate of ours. He is no chum of ours. He is not the friendly neighbor next door. He is God, and He's almighty, and He's holy. You know, holy by its very definition means set apart, or other, or as I've heard lately, something else. God is something else from us. And yet He allows us to see Him through His Son, Jesus. And as Isaiah sees this vision of the holiness of God, all he can say is, woe is me. Woe is me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. He sees his own impurity. I live among a people of unclean lips. He sees the impurity of his land. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty, he says. You know, in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ is given to John. And John, if you remember, was one of the closest friends of Jesus. The one that the Bible tells us, you know, that John and and Jesus, when they were eating together with all the disciples, John would be so close to Jesus, he'd be just kind of resting there, and they'd just be talking and sharing with one another. They were as close as brothers could get in that earthly sense. And yet when John is on the island of Patmos, he gets this revelation of Jesus which is given to him. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, this is what John writes. He hears this voice, and he turns around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, he says, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. This is Jesus. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were... His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Isn't that amazing? In his right hand, John said, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all his brilliance. And think about this. This is Jesus' friend John. What does he say? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He was so awestruck by the majesty of Jesus. And then Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. If it was good enough for John to fall down as though dead in the presence of God, what about us? What consumes us, the holiness of God, the vastness of His glory, the immeasurableness of His grandeur. You know, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, we read that the Lord Jesus is able to overthrow the powers of the world simply by the breath of His mouth and the splendor of His coming. Can you imagine the day that is coming in the future? When Jesus walks on this earth again, he's not going to have to call on armies and, and you know, jet planes and everything else. Just by the very sense that he comes, he will control the world. And he will bring peace and justice and holiness again. He will bring healing. So if we truly want to reach out into the world around us, we need to pray, Lord Jesus, Let us know you. Let us have a vision that is up. I wonder if before we go on any further, if you would all stand with me for a minute. And I just wonder if we could just maybe two or three or four of us right now, why don't we just pause and why don't you lead us in prayer and let's just pray, Lord Jesus, let us know you. So if you just want to lead the 
the church here today, you do that in prayer. Let's just take a few minutes and then I'll, I'll close it off. Mm. Yes, God, you've heard our cry and we, we just want to know you, Jesus. We want to know you more. We want you to consume our lives. Come, God, and meet us here today. We need you, Lord. The world needs you, God. Start with us. Start with us, dear Lord. You can be seated. So with a vision filling our minds and hearts of Jesus that is up, let's turn briefly to a vision that is in. Isaiah carried on and he said, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King the Lord Almighty. You know, a heart for the lost people of this world requires us to have a vision of ourselves, and that vision needs to start, as I'm sure it has for many of you in your lives, with a sense of, woe is me, I am ruined, I am unclean. But the great thing is it moves on from there very quickly, I hope. And it moved on for Isaiah in verse 6. He says, One of the angels flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar in heaven. And with it he touched my mouth, and he said this, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And he gives us this wonderful image that, yes, while we feel so unworthy in God's presence, so sinful often, God has atoned for that sin through Jesus. He has paid for that sin through Jesus, and He can make us again completely brand new. In John 1, 9, we read, For if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. You know, maybe this morning you feel broken. Maybe this morning you feel a bit dirty. I don't know what it might be. But the greatest thing of all, the greatest truth of all, is that Jesus died and rose again so that your brokenness can be healed, so that your dirtiness can be clean, so that your hopelessness can be given hope, so that your death can become life in Him. You see, the thing about becoming a follower of Jesus is not just that He touches us up a bit, makes us look a bit better. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's not, as it, becoming a follower of Jesus is not like just taking your Toyota Corolla into the workshop with a dent in the door and getting a new door, okay? It's like driving in with that Toyota Corolla with a dent in the door and driving out with an Aston Martin, all right? It's like completely new. You can't even see the difference. I mean, a Toyota is not even really a car, is it, compared to an Aston Martin? And in the same way, when you come to Jesus in your own self and you're broken and you're dented, you're a bit dirty, He doesn't just get the water blaster out and give you a bit of a clean. He says, James, that's your old life. Now I'm going to give a completely new James. Hallelujah. And that's why we have those those wonderful verses in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is is, is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I know I've spoken about that here before. But I think it is so important that we don't keep trying to live where we used to be, but we say, that is now gone. I've shut the door, and God has given me a new me. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And so with a vision up of Jesus, we need a vision in that says, yes, I was dirty. Yes, I was broken. But in Jesus, I'm whole. In Jesus, I'm new. In Jesus, I'm alive. And in Jesus, I've got a message to share with the world. Have you ever come to a point in your life where you've made the decision to follow Jesus? Where you've made a decision to say, God, my life's broken and I want it to be new. Have you ever done that? Because this morning you can do that. You can say, Lord, I've come all this way on my own and I'm struggling and I need you. Maybe you did that many years ago, but this morning again, as you've been thinking about the holiness of God and about where you are in your life, maybe God is just saying to you, hey, 
Would you come back to me? Would you stop pretending that things are okay? Would you let me take control again of your life? You know, we can make, we can pretend so much about ourselves, can't we? Leonard Ravenhill, is a great quote from him, he said this, There are three persons living in each of us. The one we think we are, the one other people think we are, and the one God knows we are. Who are you this morning? Who do you think you are? Who do others think you are? Well, I can tell you who God knows you are. God knows that you are someone that he created, that he loves, and that he died for. And he wants you to know the new life, the victory that comes in knowing him. And maybe today you need to, for the very first time, say, Jesus, come into my life. Or maybe today, for the 50th time, you need to say, Jesus, take control again. So why don't we pause for a minute just while you're seated there and let's just shut our eyes for a minute and just take a moment with God. And this morning, do you need to say to him, Lord Jesus, I've been coming along to this church for a while. I've been listening to people talk about you. I've got to know some of your family, your church people. And now this morning, God, I want to give you my life. Do you need to do that today? Because you can do that right now by just saying, Lord Jesus, I confess that I've done a lot of wrong stuff and I need you. I'm broken, Lord Jesus, but I ask that you would come and forgive me, you would come and heal me, and you would come and give me a new life. Do you need to do that this morning? Or maybe today you need to just say again, all right, God, I've been running. And actually, some people, they look at me and they don't think I'm running, but you know that I'm running. And this morning, I want to rededicate my life to you. If you'd like me just to pray for you right now while while we're here together, if you're one of those people that this morning is saying, okay, God, here's my life. Why don't you just raise your hand so I can see it and I want to pray for you this morning if that's you. Anyone this morning? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's pray for you. Father God, I want to thank you for these dear people, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus to die for because you love them. And Lord, I want to thank you today that you have a vision for them of new life and of freedom whether this is the first time today they've received you or the hundredth time, God, I thank you that you're a God of second chances and a hundred chances and many more because you're infinite, Lord, in your love towards us. But Lord, I want to pray today that the decision of a heart and a mind today would go on from here, Lord, and that this wouldn't just be a moment of emotion, but that, God, they would, love, they would live with a vision in which says, I am a new creation. The old is gone the new has come. I am loved by God. So bless these ones, Lord, this morning I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we need to have a vision up. We need to have a right vision in. And then finally, we have a vision out. Vision up, a vision in, and a vision out. For Isaiah in verse 8, it says this, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. He said, Go. Who will go for us? Here am I. Send me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we read before carries on. It says, The old is gone. The new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. For what reason? He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting people's sins against them. We have been reconciled to God, made in relationship with God, so that we can go and tell others about the wonderful message of reconciliation to God. So we're reconciled to be reconcilers. We're made new to go and tell people that they can be made new. We're given life to go to those who are dead and say, Become alive. Come and know Jesus. Come and know Him. It's the point of life. 
But if I think about my own life personally, just to be really honest here, I don't know if I know that my heart is not captured enough by the fact that all around me every single day are people that are walking to a lost eternity. You know, in, <clears throat> in many parts of the church today, we don't talk about hell. In fact, some people today say that hell is not a real place and don't worry about it. At the end of the day, it'll all be okay. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus was very clear that hell is a real place. It's an eternal place. It's a place where those who do not accept the gift of God's grace will go. It's a place where some of our families and friends and workmates and neighbors are going to go. And we need God to touch our hearts with the reality of that. I do. Let me talk about me. I need that. The reality of eternity is so strong. William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, he's quoted as saying this, that he said that he would, if he could have done it, he would have finished the training course for his Salvation Army soldiers by hanging them over hell for 24 hours to see its eternal torment, he said, because he knew that it would change them forever. I don't know what vision God would give us, but I pray that it would be a vision that breaks our heart for the lost, a vision that lets us see people for the truth of who they really are. They may look like they've got it all together on the outside, but may God give us eyes that are perceptive beyond the outside skin to actually see people for who they are, eternal beings. You know, the Bible says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women. We are eternal beings. And we are either going to live for eternity with Jesus Christ or eternity in hell. Where are we going to be? Where are our friends and family going to be? I want to finish with a story from a guy who... His, his first name is Nabil, and you may have read his story. He writes a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And he, is a, or he was a Muslim man who had grown up in a very devout Muslim family, in a loving family, mum and dad, who just taught him uh, in, you know, to be a, a lovely young man, and they were devout Muslims. Well, he became a follower of Christ. And I want to read to you what he says. He said that when he had told his father that he'd become a follower of Jesus Christ, he realized, he said, and I'll read to you now, I had not given up just my life to follow Jesus. I was killing my father by telling him that. He has never stood as tall since that day. I extinguished his pride. Why, God, he cries out. Well, my mother had even fewer words than my father, but her eyes said more. You are my only son. You came from my womb. Since you were born, I have called you, my, my son, a physical piece of my life and heart. I cradled you, sang to you, taught you the ways of God every day since you came into this world. I have loved you with all of me in a way I have loved no one else. Why have you betrayed me? His mother said to him. Her eyes seared my soul and remained branded in my memory. They were the final image I saw before my father ushered my mother out of my apartment and to the hospital across the street. None of us were sure she would make it through the night. She survived, but her eyes have never been as bright since that day. I extinguished their light. Decimated before God, eyes pouring, nose and mouth unable to withhold the grief, I was finally able to sputter my question through tears and mucus. Why, God, did you not kill me the moment I believed? Why did you leave me here? Why did you leave me to hurt my family more deeply than they've ever been hurt? They never deserved this. I've destroyed it all. Nothing is left. Why didn't you kill me? I pleaded with God, full of despair because it was too late. It would have been better if you'd killed me that moment I believed, so my family would never have had to taste betrayal. This is far worse for them than my death would have been. At least our love would have lived on. At least our family would have always been one. Why, God? At that moment, the most agonizing moment of my life, something happened that was beyond my theology and imagination. As if God picked up a megaphone and spoke through my conscience, I heard these words resonate through my very being. Because this is not about you. 
Then I saw something that I had seen countless times before, a man walking down the sidewalk towards the medical school. But that was not all I saw. Though I had no idea who this man was, I knew he had a dramatic story, replete with personal struggles, broken relationships, and splintered self-worth. Taught by the world that he was an outcome of blind evolution, he subconsciously valued himself as exactly that, a byproduct of random chance with no purpose, no hope, no meaning except what pleasures he could extract out of the day. Chasing these pleasures resulted in guilt and pain, which caused him to chase more pleasures, which led to more guilt and more pain. Bearing it all just beneath the surface, he went about his day with no clue how to break the cycle, how to find true hope. What I saw was a man who needed to know that God could rescue him, that God had rescued him. This man needed to know about God and his power. Did he know? Did he know? Of course not. We have to tell him, he says. And he finishes with this. While I was wallowing in self-pity, focused on myself, there was a whole world with literally billions of people who had no idea who God is, how amazing he is, and the wonders he has done for us. They are the ones who are really suffering. They don't know his hope, his peace, and his love that transcends all understanding. They don't know the message of the gospel. This is not about me. It is about him and his love for his children. Lord God, I want to pray this morning for each of us here that you would give us a vision of this world, Lord God, of the brokenness of humanity. Lord, I ask that we would not be so consumed with ourselves, God, with our own priorities, our own pressing needs, our own even health or whatever it might be. Lord, we know those things are real, but I pray that above and beyond it, Lord, Lord, we would have a heart for others, God. A vision that is out. Because, Lord, we've been consumed by a vision that is up. A realization that you have made us new so that, God, we can reach to the world around us. So, Lord, I want to pray for this church here. God, I want to pray for the lighthouse that, Father, you would, Lord, continue the work that you have started here. But Lord, I want to pray specifically for people here this morning, God, that are just, I don't know, Lord, it's like they're just not willing to really bet everything on you. God, I pray that this morning they would bet the house on you, Lord. They would bet their lives on you and that, God, that would transform them into this world around them. Father, we pray for, for the wire Apple, Lord. We pray for Masterton. Lord, we pray for the people here that desperately need you. God, I ask that you would, would force back the darkness in this city, Lord God. Lord, that the, the shadow that is over so many lives of depression, Lord, of suicide, of other things, God, we ask in your name, Lord Jesus, that you would cut that back, Lord God, that you would shine the light of the gospel in here, Lord. Father, inspire these people, not by me, but by the power of your Spirit, Lord, to work in this city with all diligence for you, God. Lord, as they work with the children, as they work with families, with the elderly, in their workplaces, wherever it may be, God, anoint them, God, with your Holy Spirit, with your power, with your passion, with your vision, God. Lord, I ask also that in this church, Lord, you would raise up intercessors, Lord, Lord, prayers, Lord, people that may not be seen by the rest of the church, but Lord, in their own homes, in their own cupboards, God, they're on their knees. Lord, make us a praying people. Lord, nothing will happen without prayer. Lord, make us a praying people. Oh God, if you want all the programs to finish and the prayer to start, may we hear that. May it be prayer, God. Lord, we desperately need you. The world needs you. You say, who will go for me? Lord, may we say, here are we. Send us. And may individually we say, here am I. Send me. Does anyone else want to pray this morning? And just lead us?